So I think I was trying to think the last time we talked was I think the Cavs had just gone down 0-3 in the finals. We have more vacation than Howard Stern. <laughs> than Tony Rizzo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is the Three Sports Podcast. I am Ben Axrod. He is Craig Lindell of Waiting for Next Year. Uh, we haven't done one of these in, in a couple of months, maybe a month or so. A lot has happened since then, I think. Yeah. <laughs> well, and honestly, I didn't want to talk about the LeBron stuff before LeBron made a decision. Right. I don't want to. I don't want to be the predictor guy. I don't want to waste a bunch of time talking about speculation. Mm-hmm. You know, and obviously we will do some speculation about the Browns and their upcoming season and the Indians and the moves that they've made. But yeah. like, there's certain types of sports stories that speculation drives me batty. Well, I think it's interesting because we started doing this podcast. Last September, if I recall correctly. Yeah, it was supposed to be kind of a Browns thing. Yeah, and and we, we started talking about the Cavs a little bit. We, we would talk about the Browns, and then we would hit on the Cavs maybe at the end, especially right. with the season coming up. And the LeBron stuff had been going on at that point for months already. Like, the by the time LeBron made his decision earlier this month, it had been going on for a year, really. And over the course of that year, from when the Lakers first got brought up last finals to when he finally signed with the Lakers, there was never really a fun way to talk about it. And and I don't think that's a Cleveland thing. Like, I I think people were forcing LeBron conversations. Oh, maybe he'll go to Houston. Maybe he'll go to Philly. What what if he he went to the Clippers instead of the Lakers? There was really no... I don't know if it's because the Lakers were kind of thought to be the front runner all along. But there was never really just like a fun way to have that conversation, at least compared to his previous two free agencies. No, and the thing about LeBron is that we know that nobody knows anything. They, right. He keeps his information close, his motivations even closer. Mm-hmm. Nobody, everyone's going, well, he's going to do it with Paul George and Kawhi, and yeah. he needs this, and he needs that. Apparently, he didn't need anything but right. whatever he felt like. Yeah. And so all the that's what bugs me is everybody thinks everybody, you know, like Chris <laughs> Sheridan doing victory laps today and Bill Simmons doing victory laps, you know, over the last month. And it's like, okay, you predicted L.A. because he's got a house there, but you don't actually have sources. You don't actually know anything. You had to wait like the rest of us, mostly. It does seem like there was... A lot of people had the L.A. thing, though. And, and yeah. For whatever reason... Be... Any dummy could have predicted Cleveland or L.A. Right. Any dummy. Well, and, but but what's interesting about it was this clearly wasn't a basketball move. No. Like, they're just based on the fact that... But that's also what, to your larger point about how nobody knows anything, it's so funny that people didn't learn this lesson in 2010 and 2014. You, you go back to 2010, I'm sure you can find a million tweets of people saying, oh, he would never go to Miami. That's Dwayne Wade's team. Oh, he would never take the easy way out and join up with two stars. And what did he do? And it worked out. Go, go to 2014. Because NBA fans convinced themselves that that's Dwayne Wade's team is, is a legit <laughs> thing. It doesn't mean anything. Well, and you go You're to making it up. You go to 2014. Oh, he would never go back and play for Dan Gilbert. Oh, he he would never go back to Cleveland. Oh, he would never want to team up with two younger guys and have to teach them all over again. What does he do? He comes back and plays for Dan Gilbert, and then to LA, people spent. You know, especially Cavs fans, they spent all year saying, well, that's Kobe's old team. That's, that's Magic's team. He could only be the eighth best player in franchise history. He would never go there and want to play with Lonzo Ball and deal with LeVar. I'm, I'm sure I was guilty of that thought process at one point oh, or yeah. another too. Me too. But he, he made his decision and LeBron doesn't care what anybody thinks. LeBron operates on his terms. It, it, you know, you, you try to follow the people like Brian Winhorst and, and Dave McMenamin and, sure. and, and Jason Lloyd and Joe Varden, the guys who are most plugged into this stuff. L.A. was always a real possibility. And, and the Cavs, whether this was predetermined a year ago or the Cavs just never put up a fight, it's almost like, and I guess we can get into how we process the LeBron thing. From a Cavs perspective, I think the Cavs operated under the assumption that he was leaving and therefore never gave him a reason not to. And maybe that was right, that they operated in their own interests without ever putting up a fight. That That's a whole other discussion. But as far as the timeline of all this goes, it seems pretty clear that the Cavs felt he was leaving. Even and therefore, back to the Kyrie trade. Yeah, and therefore kind of forfeited the free agency. I don't think the Cavs ever really put up a fight in this. 
I I think that they were resigned to it yes. by the time. I think David Griffin's parting words mm-hmm. to Dan Gilbert and their whole mo was, "I don't think LeBron's going to stay long term. He won't commit to us long term, and we shouldn't be mad about it. But mm-hmm. this is how we have to operate." Uh, and I'm making that up. I don't know that. Yeah. But it just, in hindsight, when you look at a team that had LeBron, Kyrie, Kevin Love, and then in basically 14 months has Kevin Love, mm-hmm. that's that's pretty telling. That's pretty telling. Um, I think it reflects poorly on Dan Gilbert. I think history will make it look exceptionally stupid, whether that's fair or not. Um, this time period is so heavily dominated by players and their wishes. Mm-hmm. But I don't know how his, the history books can ever look back on these Cavaliers teams and not look at it as a wholly wasted opportunity of having three legit all-stars and and two legit superstars and going down to one maybe all-star in a 14-month span. Well, I think the... Yeah, I mean, the Kyrie thing, that really, it's crazy, actually. As we record this, do you, do you realize that tomorrow is the one-year anniversary of, and I only know it because it's the one-year anniversary of when I moved to Cleveland. It's the one year, we actually recorded a podcast. That's uh, <laughs> it's the one, talking about Derrick Rose. Uh, oh it's gosh. the one-year anniversary of when we all found out Kyrie wanted out. Oh, man. Isn't that crazy? That is So crazy. a year ago on July 20th, for all we knew, LeBron James and Kyrie Irving were perfectly content in Cleveland. And, and what's even crazier is the what ifs, mm-hmm. the what ifs. So, so LeBron decides to go to L.A. Maybe he was always going to do that mm-hmm. if the Cavaliers had just held out with Kyrie and just said, look, you're under contract. We know we'll, we'll listen to offers. We'll try and make it work, but we can't make any promises. Yeah. And just not play chicken, but, you know, work it – would Kyrie have been happy to stay sure. once LeBron left? Yeah. It, it, there, I mean, there are so many what-ifs in this. And it's also, you know, you, you mentioned Griffin and, and Gilbert. I think my understanding of it, or at least how I view it, and, and I think how most people view it, is Gil, Griffin probably wanted to just go all in and trade for Paul George and say, if this is LeBron's last year, we need to maximize this window. And Gilbert because he's been burned by LeBron in the past. That's very clear. Dan Gilbert did not want to go through the 2010-2011 season again. He basically hit fast forward to that first year where they got Kyrie. He's, he's got he's got distant memories of Shaq. Yeah. Making what 20 million dollars. Well, he he was gone by then, but he has I, I think it's more memories of the 26 game losing streak and he didn't want to go through that complete No, tear. I meant like so trading for Paul George, right? Oh, right, is like right, right. Redoing the Shaq I gotcha. season, yeah. Yeah, and then for what? So that we can have absolutely nothing but Jamario Moon left when LeBron decides to leave. That's kind of. I, I think that's actually one of the. You're right. One of the things we'll never know about this Cavs era mm-hmm. is how it would have been different without the Warriors. Yeah, and <laughs> I mean they kind of for for as much as they have ruined. You know, you look at, at like Houston has this great window, and they're probably never going to win anything. Right. The the Cavs. I mean, thank God for 2016, right? Like, oh if, if they didn't get that, that is a whole different conversation, and that's obviously a very real conversation that could have happened. Yeah. Well, and if if uh, and even that was just hanging by a thread. If mm-hmm. Draymond Green doesn't get suspended, yeah. And I mean, it's just it's. Well, so think about the. I mean, not unlikely. Not to go to the cliche of like inches mattering in sports, but think yeah. about the inches in that game seven from not only the shot and the block, but uh, Jr's threes at, at when they coming out of halftime. Uh, Those threes and the Warriors misses down yeah. the stretch. The, the hottest team in NBA history got cold for an entire quarter. It like, was unbelievable. It, it's. It's, it's crazy. Um, how, so LeBron left. Yep. How, how did you process it this time around? So I wasn't mad. I ended up being a little bit more, a little bit sadder than I thought. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I hate to just go straight to this because I'm not doing it for effect or to be right. But, you know, I, I did tell my eight year old he was kind of bummed. Yeah. And he, he was funny though. He, I saw him processing it in real time and there were two things. He was like, Oh, well, 
at least he didn't go to the Warriors, which was really funny. Yeah. And then and then he asked me how old LeBron was, and he was like, "Well, everybody has to retire someday." Yeah. Those were his two thoughts, and I'm like, "Well, that's pretty." I guess. Yeah. I think that's. Yeah, I think it was more sad than mad. Yeah. Um, you know, because he could have retired. I mean, he spent 11 years in Cleveland at this point. Like, he could have conceivably retired. Like, sure. what he's doing right now is already unprecedented. So that was a uh, that was a adv- very advanced thought that your son. Had. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I don't. I don't really respect the move to LA. I don't. I didn't grow up a Lakers fan. I don't care about the 80s. I don't. I don't sit in in reverence of the history of the NBA. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I I guess I respect the history, but. Whatever, like. Well, it's kind I, of interesting. How as do a, I feel about the Atlanta Braves? Eh, I don't. But it's kind of interesting, you know? though, as a Cavs fan, because the Cavs are a very, you know, they what they were born in 1970, but they're a yeah. very unhistoric team. They, yeah, they're a very, you know, for all intents and purposes, like they are not a storied franchise. No, they they are almost still like an expansion franchise. Like they have changed their jersey colors even six in, times. Yeah, even including <laughs> those electric, those electric jersey. Years, right. Yeah. They they have just no. You know, even when you think of the dearly departed Sonics, like right. their uniforms were classic, mm-hmm. and they've got. I think of them. I I can think of their history. Yeah. You, you know. But it's interesting because a lot of you know from the outside, it, like I think a lot of people just when they think Cleveland Cavaliers, they think LeBron James. Yes. And so that's for him to go to the Lakers where. You think about Kobe and you think about Shaq and you think about Magic and all those guys. It, it is interesting because also the Heat, I mean, the Heat were born in 89. Like they're, they are an expansion franchise. I guess that's almost 30 years now, but. Well, and how do you think about Shaq today? I mean, I you, think of Shaq as Shaq. Like I think of him. Because he played not only in LA. Right. And Cleveland and Miami, but Boston. Oh, and, and Orlando. I mean, I think a lot of people think about him as much of a ma- member of the Magic where he spent four years as they do the Lakers. And, but that's, I mean, that, in a way, that's sports today. But it, it is unique, um, especially to Shaq, because I don't think a, an all-time great has truly bounced around like that. But, yeah, I mean, it's funny because you, I figured I would just follow LeBron wherever he went. And, and I don't mean in terms of I'll stop caring about the Cavs. I cover the Cavs. I'm, for all intents and purposes, still a fan of the Cavs. I'm very locked into what the Cavs are doing. But I figured, like, I would just have two teams then. And I'm still rooting for LeBron. I'd love to see him win another ring. I, 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 I'm still very invested in LeBron James uh, because of what he means to Northeast Ohio and all of that. But I don't really care what happens with the Lakers. And I don't, you know, I don't, I mean, LeBron does care, but... Based on going there this year without any guarantees of another star, it's not his priority. No. And, and that's fine. I mean, that's, I think we have, so much has changed since 2010 that we can look at it and, and accept that this is the, I, I mean, he made this move for his family. Like, I don't know in, in his business and whatever, but this was clearly something he wanted to do. When you look at it, there wasn't really any alternative. Well, and it's not as fun anymore because mm-hmm. now it's it's how long can LeBron play at that high level? Right. Can he do it in his 34 and 35-year-old seasons? Can he... And and that's not fun. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't I don't want to see LeBron versus Father Time. Right. You know I want, always want to remember LeBron winning the championship and oh. and his best years with the Cavaliers. And now not only is he playing for a different team, but the storyline just doesn't feel as good to me. Yeah, it's gonna be. And I'm not rooting for him to decline. Right. But it happens to everybody. And well, there, so that's really the next opponent for him more there, than anything else. There's definitely a part of this that looks like Jordan with the Wizards. Yes. Like that, that has that Thank potential. You. Yes. And it, I mean, it happens in, in sports everywhere. It's, and he still was Michael Jordan. Right. He still had that appeal. It was still a big deal when he came into town. I remember when he came to Cleveland for the last time on his, his farewell tour. Uh, there is. There was a part of me, and it was completely, you know, Cleveland-centric, fan-centric, that him aging in a Cavs jersey, like Kobe aging in a Lakers jersey, looks a lot better than if he goes somewhere and they never win anything, and, and it's just those, he's writing it out. But, I mean, that's, 
you know, you can't tell that to LeBron James. He doesn't think that's ever going to happen. So No, and he, he thinks he'll be able to mold and change his game mm-hmm. so that he can be an effective, Im- it, impactful player. And the in the big career. picture, it doesn't matter. No. In the big picture, Jordan is still Jordan. Joe Namath is still a Jet and not a Ram. And Michael Jordan didn't ruin his legacy right. by playing with the Wizards. Right. And so... Not at all. It, but but it, you're right. I mean, it's going to be very interesting, especially with Golden State showing no signs of slowing down or, or anything like that. What about the Cavs? Do you, this, so this is now... The Cavs enter this new era. I will say, I, it is just like... I mean, from a content standpoint, it sucks. But like, it is refreshing yeah. that... Uh, there's a new way to look at the Cavs now rather than just championship or bust. Although I guess the prism now, so now there's a big divide, tank or not to tank. So, but you're right. From a content standpoint, the storyline, we've been writing the same thing for Mm -hmm. four years now. Yeah. And, or at least three years. That first year was a little bit different. But every, LeBron trained us in year one of coming back that the regular season did not matter at all. Um, I I already knew it from from watching the Heat years. <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't watch the Heat. I, years, a lot but. of people did it, and so I was sitting back in 2015, just like, uh huh, uh huh. Yeah, there's literally a calendar you can do and just check off, like, okay, yeah, this is when he's going to make the passive aggressive comment about the coach. This is when the trade's <laughs> going to happen. This is when there's going to be the social media blow up. Do LeBron and Eric Spolstra <laughs> get along? Did he bump Eric Spolstra? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, no, I, and and we talked about it before we turned on the mics. You would yeah. never root to not have LeBron and not make the playoffs. But I'd be lying if I said I didn't have a little bit of fatigue over the last four right. years. And so I'm kind of look in a weird way, even though it's not my preferred outcome. Mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to having something different to, to talk about. I'm looking forward to having Colin Sexton. I really do respect the what what I think the Cavaliers are doing in terms of going into the season without going full tank. Yeah. And then seeing where they... I, I think it's the best way to maximize the value on Kevin Love, number one, mm-hmm. if they do end up right. trading him. And number two, I don't think full-on tank necessarily mean is the best way to build your team. I don't think it's the best way to maximize Colin Sexton. Right. And and that's the stuff that bothers me. Um, that, that goes back to our Sashi Brown con- conversation. Right. And I don't think Philadelphia's way was the only way. I think you've seen Houston do... Houston's not a premier destination. Uh Uh-uh. And they've found ways to never full-on tank. I think... I I agree. I I think that the fact... But again, I... Sorry, I I don't mean to cut you off, but I also don't think the Cavaliers have a Daryl Morey. No. No, they certainly don't right now. And that's... If you... So tanking is very... I mean, high risk, high reward, right? Yep. So Philly, it worked out perfectly because they have two legitimate all-stars right now. But it wasn't without risk because Nerlens Noel's gone. Oh, and it wasn't without luck because if Joel Embiid is healthy heading into the 2014 draft, he's either on the Cavs or on the Timberwolves right now. And And they had a lost year of uh, Ben Simmons. Ben Simmons. And if they... um, I mean, yeah, it's the, the, there is luck to all of it. And look, for, for every Philadelphia, there is uh, a Minnesota. Minnesota, you look at their build, it couldn't have started out any better. They get Andrew Wiggins and they get Carl Anthony Towns. And now they're like in turmoil already. Like they're already in, well, this Carl Anthony Towns wants to leave. Oh no, we already overpaid Andrew Wiggins. Like it is so the yeah, NBA. You can't just suck your way to the top. No. You need, you need to hire the right coach, have the right GM, have the right ownership, have all these things going. Well, think about it too from this perspective. The Cavs tank after the, the first time LeBron left could not have gone better. Right. You got the number one pick three out of four years. It was unprecedented. And at the end of it, you still needed LeBron James, the greatest player in basketball, yes. to come and bail you out. Because even in that final year in 2013 to 14, they were trying to make the playoffs because losing, as we learned with the Browns, gets tired really quick. It's, it's, yep. it's, 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 it's fine to say at the start, okay, we'll lose and then it will pay off at the end. But going through those three seasons of sucking by the fourth year, you're ready to compete and then you rush it. And that's when you make mistakes like signing Jarrett Jack and Earl Clark. It's toxic. It it's it, it creates sits, a terrible environment. It sits in the carpets and the walls. You can't clean the smell out, mm-hmm. and and it's really hard to raise 
I say raise up because we're talking about 18 and 19 right. year old athletes. It's hard to develop players in that environment and, and keep their eye on the prize and not develop bad habits. Yeah. I, I mean, I think generally the smart thing to do, if you were to say the goal is to get the next NBA superstar, the, you should tank. Yeah. Especially while the rules still favor, because they're phasing out. They're basically trying to phase out tanking. Yes. And right now, even with the changes they've made in the lottery, it still behooves you to tank and have one of the three worst records in the NBA. Now it just it doesn't matter if you have the, the worst or third worst. But be, I also think, and everybody points to that pick that the Cavs owe Atlanta um, because of the Kyle Korver trade. And so the Cavs need it. What is it? Top 10 protect. It's top, it's 10, top protected. 10 protected. So the Cavs, yeah. if they don't have one of the 10 worst records, they lose that pick. Right. They're also they're also a year ahead already with Colin Sexton. And so if you lose the pick, you already have Colin Sexton who you shouldn't have anyways. It's and they still have the trade assets. Mm-hmm. Whether we're talking about Kyle Korver or right. Kevin Love. Now is not the time to trade Kevin Love no. if you're going to trade him. No. And I also don't I don't like the idea of just punting on having Kevin Love. No. For for who knows what he looks like now as the number one option. And I think it's going to, this is what's going to be tough, and this is going to be like a fight. With and he's him. going to take some pressure off Colin Sexton. Right. Which is going to allow Colin Sexton not to be demoralized. Right. I mean, I would if they, if they trade Korver, if they trade JR, if they trade Tristan, if they make any combination of those moves, I'll understand it and not look at it as a full-on tank. But Kevin Love is kind of that one, that piece still who, I mean, when, when they trade him, their intentions will be pretty clear. Right. But I also think that, if that he's the most valuable asset. Right. So to bring something back for Kevin Love is it, it's it's the perfect hedge. It's it's is it tanking? No, we kept him for half a season and we got an asset that we can use in 6 months instead of yeah. in 12 months. It but it, yeah, I mean it will depend on what his value is by then cuz I don't I don't know what his value is right now. And that's I mean especially I think he's worth a first round pick. For a contender, probably a protected, yeah, like a, a middle of the pick. road, a middle of the road contender. So I think probably the 12, 13, 14, somewhere in that range, just out of the lottery, for a team that's trying to get in. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know who has those picks. It's probably a contender who will be drafting twenty five or lower right. who has somebody else's pick. I, I think this is the what's going to be. This is going to be the new fight within the Cavs fan base. Is I wouldn't know because I'm not on Twitter. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. So for the last four years, it was championship or bust. Yep. And so my question to that is: so that's the idea of tanking is to get the easiest way to get back into championship mode is to get another superstar by tanking, and then you're able to build and, and eventually compete for championships. My question, and I guess my counter is. Isn't the Cavs, just being realistic about the Cavs and, and their place in the NBA, isn't it much more realistic to expect them to be the Indiana Pacers? It's Yes. But I, I also think that there's room for them to create their own paradigm. I think they could be the Houston Rockets. If they, if they could put the right pieces in place and get their cap in, mm-hmm. the, in the right scenario, I felt like David Griffin had the potential to be that wizard with the cap. And, yeah. and he knew all the moving pieces and buyouts and um, uh, trade exceptions and all these different kinds of assets that most people, it's hard to understand because yeah. it's so complex. Right. I, I think there's a, a path there too, but the Cavaliers need to figure out what they're going to do and put the right pieces in place. I don't know, I don't know Kobe Altman. Mm-hmm. Maybe he is that guy. But, I mean, you, if you and I were to sit here and predict it, we would be guessing and lying and making right. things up. I mean, yeah. I mean, nothing in Kobe Altman. I, I think it's pretty tough to judge Kobe Altman, like, based on his track record and in the last year. And there's nothing in Dan Gilbert to predict right. he's the and right owner either. There's certainly nothing. I mean, yeah. So that's – but, I mean, Indiana had played in, what, two straight Eastern Conference finals, yep. and then Paul George wanted out, and they swapped him for Victor Oladipo, and – now they're the third or fourth best team in the Eastern Conference. For, or no, it's because it's Toronto, Philly, Boston, and then like 
there's a second tier with Indiana. Like, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad place to be, to be in the playoffs every year. And then maybe one year, either you do draft a Paul George or you, you make your big swing in a trade or something. I don't, I don't think it's the worst place to be. No. I don't, no. And I think for the Cavs, that's, you're never going to be a free agent destination. I mean, that's the difference with Houston is Houston is a free agent destination. But why? Bigger city, no state income tax. Yeah. I mean, they got Chris Paul. They did get Chris Paul, but they got Chris Paul because they had James Harden. They got James Harden through a trade, right. and they've got a wizard who knows the salary cap. Yeah, no. But like, we don't weren't putting Houston on the L.A. on the L.A. No, but they're track. always, you know, whenever a free agent comes up, they're always in the conversation. Because of Daryl Morey. I think even before that. I think I, even I with... I disagree. Like, you know, like Chris Bosh would always get linked to them. Uh, Tracy, I mean, they got Tracy McGrady. I know that was through a trade, but they've always just for whatever reason. I mean, maybe it's just coincidence, but they've had, trades. for my whole lifetime, they've had a star. So it's always been trades. And draft, but they've always had a star. Yeah, for, trades and draft. But I don't, I, I think Houston is probably a more appealing city for an NBA player. I, I mean, it is th- than Cleveland. Slightly, but it's not my point. I think is, more than slightly. <laughs> but it's not LA. No, but there's, there's what, two LAs? LA and Miami? Well, and New York. I and, mean, I mean and, and none of those teams have been able to draw. But my point is that, you know, then San Antonio. The, San Antonio is not a hotbed. No. I, I know they've got tax advantages. Right. But it's, you know, so does Orlando. Yeah. And that doesn't work. It's, it's more than just the, the average time in the wintertime. Yeah. And the tax rate. It is. The Cav- but cold weather, I mean, what other than New York, what's been the biggest cold weather city? Boston. They they don't draw for, I mean, I get, yeah, no, they do. <laughs> but I don't think Cleveland can be Boston. But there are only two or three cities that draw free agents. Right. That's my point. Yeah. The Cavaliers can be a destination if they're smart with their trades. And then they could have gotten James Harden. They could make James Harden happy. But how, how could they have kept James Harden? I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, I mean, but, that's the the Cavs' track record is, I mean, other than LeBron James, what? Who's their biggest free agent signing? I no, I'm I'm not saying free agent signings. Right. But they didn't surround James Harden with Chris Paul by free agent right. choice. It was I a trade. You. So that's all. It, yeah. You know, it's you. You need to create a home that people want to come to. You have to have the flexibility in the cap space, and you have to be as smart or smarter than everybody else. Yeah, and that's there there's no indication that that's where they are no. right now and that's what's going to make this next season and, and a full on tank doesn't prove that you're smart. It no. doesn't. Well, clearly because of the last time it I mean that do you, that 2013-14 season, that was a disaster. That was after having won three lotteries in 4 years and it was an utter a was bigger disaster. The, was that the That was the year, Bynum year. That was Andrew the Andrew Bynum year. That's Luol Deng year. I mean, it was the... I remember where I was when I heard Andrew Bynum. It, you know what? Before LeBron, that was the biggest free agent signing in Cavs history. When Andrew Bynum was taking half-court shots during practice, and they basically had to throw him out. That was like Christmas Day or thing. That was like over Christmas break. I remember that. I remember that very, uh, very clearly. Yeah. yeah. So that anyway. was bad. Um, should we move to the Browns? Yeah, or or do you want to talk about the Indians qu- almost quickly because I don't I don't think there are any yeah. hot takes. I don't, the, really, for the cat or for the uh, for the Browns and the Indians, I don't really have any yeah. hot takes. I, I will say, you know, I think when we talked about the Indians, we kind of said it's it, it's going to be like the Cavs, where it's like, all right, let's just get to the playoffs. Yes, I will say uh, Jose Ramirez's uh, emergence as a legitimate MVP contender has changed that for me. Yes. Like, now they are worth watching every night. Adam the Bull, I can't remember how many seasons, but he has been saying that yeah. over the last two this or is three a good seasons, take. Jose Ramirez has been better than Bryce Harper. It's a it's a reasonable take. It's legit. It is. It's jarring to look at those. I'm not a baseball guy, so I'm not even going to pretend to be, but yeah. even just to look at the home run list and see that, what, he has 29 at the All-Star break. Uh, OPS, I know that's like the big stat now everybody looks at, is just like, it's mind boggling to see Jose, little Jose Ramirez at the top of all these lists. Yeah, regardless of advanced stats, yeah. he is so much better than everybody else right now. It's, it's disgusting. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things where I actually, I went to that Yankees game 
uh, the Saturday before the All-Star break and we were walking over there and we were running a little bit late and we heard the fireworks go off and I look at my phone and it's Jose and you just, I think it was his 29th home run, you just shake your head and it's just like, this is amazing. Well, and he's, he's blasting them out opposite field. He, mm-hmm. he's, just, he's just hitting the ball. Yeah. Like I've never seen since Manny Ramirez. And, and then you, you, you factor that in with Francisco Lindor doing what he's doing and... Yep. Um, I mean, that is... I and know, Michael Brantley doing what yeah. he's doing. Where did that come from? Because, honestly, that's another one. Concern was warranted. Yes. It completely... <laughs> do not throw that take back in people's faces. Told you. It was... <laughs> it wasn't mind-boggling that they picked up the option to bring him back. No. It was mind-boggling that they didn't decline the option to try to sign him to a, a lower salary. Yes. Because there wasn't much of a market for him, I didn't think. Yeah, the idea that they couldn't get him back on that Grady size more yeah. reduced contract. But um, hey, I'll I'll eat my words on that one. I will take it. Yeah. I will take it. But the the key <laughs> the key to all I this, knew exactly where you were going with that and I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. But we we get so mad. <laughs> and they're not straw men. People are out there. Yeah. Um but the the real key here is that this team despite its failures in the bullpen is so worthwhile and yeah. so capable of making noise in October and winning the World Series that to see the Indians go out and trade Mejia for Hand and Simber mm-hmm. and bolster that bullpen is exactly what they should be doing. Yeah. They did it. Um, they can they can claim, uh, they legitimate, legitimately can claim that they're tying up guys for more than one year with club control, and that's great. Right. But they are investing. They're going for it now. And it's exactly what they should be doing with Lindor and Ramirez. Yeah. You, you don't get Lindor Ramirez and a two-time Cy Young Award winner right? like this. Well, and this basically, I mean, that, that trade that they made, I don't think was any small deal. It, it nope. basically helps extend your window through as long as you control Lindor. And yep. who knows what will happen after that. I mean, God, Jose's contract, though, like... This team can afford to spend a little because they're paying him thirty million dollars less than they should be. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's the it's funny because you know the '90s. This is beginning to rival the '90s just in terms of yes. prolonged success and, and the sheer amount of talent out there on the field. And it, it's so cliche to say, and we said it about the Cavs for four years. You know, savor this, cherish this, whatever. That period between the '90s and now. That was real. And that lasted a decade. I mean, that lasted what? From 03 to, to 13, basically? Um, I'm sorry. What? The, the period between the 90s and now oh, of yeah, yeah, just yeah. like really Medi- irrelevance. Mediocrity. Yeah. I mean, they, I know they made, there was 07, obviously. And then they, well, it was 05. They made a really strong push. That was a really good team, I thought, 05. The, yeah, the Eric Wedge years yeah, were, were they, dark. Yeah. And then Manny Acto was even darker. Yeah. But, but that's, I mean, there will be another great era of Indians baseball after this. I'm, yes. I'm sure of that. But who knows when it will be. And this, and this one very well could. We might be in the middle of a 90s Indians That's what I, run, yeah. For sure. I think we are. I think, well, we'll see if they can, if they can... They need to make some noise in this playoff. Well, they already have their, what, 2016? <laughs> they yeah. already have their, their one World Series failure. They just need another, and <laughs> they'll match the 90s. <laughs> we but, just need to lose the Florida Marlins. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I guess it would be the Marlins. Um, so, yeah. I mean, that's just enjoy the Indians because they're fun. Um, Browns optimism? You there yet? Yeah. I, uh, I'm the Training high- camps next week. I'm, I'm really uh, looking forward to them getting started this year. And I can't say that for the last two years. Um, I think that uh, my my hot take is that I truly think this team can win eight games. I, I wouldn't predict it. I wouldn't put money on it. The over-under is like four and a half. And five and a half. Five and a half. Mark and, Wahlberg bet it. And that's exactly where it should be. Yeah. But people think I'm crazy saying that they could win eight games. But, no. But Tyrod Taylor won nine last year. This team has added at every single level. And eight wins is not good. No. I need to remind Browns fans <laughs> oh, oh. that eight wins is not good. Oh, I eight, it's not good. And that was the frustrating part about last season. Only was, here is it good. 
Oh, the the frustrate the most frustrating part. I mean, there were so many frustrating yeah. parts of last season, but people complaining about Hugh and saying, "If you look at it, this is a four win team, and he hasn't won a game yet." Okay, well, that is not a defense of Sashi Brown that in his second year he built a four win team. <laughs> he underperformed four hundred percent. Do you know what the margin of error is on a four win team? Right. From I mean, that's the problem. Right. So I'm telling you now that the five and a half over under means that this this could be an eight-win team. <laughs> right. And that's still not good. Right. That's just a... I would always... Oh, I, I would always argue with people about that. But they, I really think the Browns might have leaped the Bengals and the Ravens. Well, the NFL's built for that to happen. Yes. I mean, the NFL, from from a schedule... I know people look at the Browns' schedule and say it's brutal. Every every team's... The schedule doesn't mean anything. No. There's so much turnover and change from year right. to year and injuries and everything else that... Unless, unless it's the Patriots, year over year over year, it, it might as well be college that's graduating well, kids. It's funny because you'll say eight wins or you think they could get to eight wins, yeah. and people will say that's insane. They didn't win a game last year. You're not going from zero wins to eight wins. It's not a linear no. thing. I mean, on, on the surface it is, Rest. but every team is different. Every schedule is different. And the Browns should beat the Packers last year. Right. Why? Because Aaron Rodgers was hurt, right? But but that nobody, was the one. That was the one time I thought they were going to win. But nobody would have predicted, <laughs> you know, schedule game beginning of the season. The Browns are going to beat the Packers, right? No, of course not. Yeah. And so that's why I, I say that. Yeah. And, and of course, if the Browns get massively, massively injured, they're going to win two games. Yeah. It's. I mean, or zero. Yeah. But. I think they're out of the woods on that one. I hope they are. The thing... <laughs> We're having a realistic conversation the thing to, that the Browns are out of the woods on zero wins. To, to, I will say, though, uh, the schedule sets up to where it's... Um, they have those three games at yeah. the start of the season, and the third game is a Thursday night against the Jets. Uh, if they start out 0-3... They're going to be Pittsburgh in week one. That's my hot take. Ooh, hot... Spicy. The Steelers are so veteran. They always a lot of people slow. are pre- a lot of people are predicting a down year for the Steelers. That's like the hot. That's like the the popular prediction. Right Regardless now. of my prediction for the Steelers, they're like the regular season Cavs. They just kind of chill. Yeah. They work their way into the season. They take they take their preseason very slowly, and the Browns almost punched them in the mouth last yeah. year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if I'm Hugh Jackson. From the moment I acquired Tyrod Taylor, I would have been scheming for Pittsburgh because they have to win one of these first three Todd games. Haley. They have to win one of these first three you games. You think Todd Haley wants to win opening week against Pittsburgh? Uh, well, if he, if he doesn't, he might be promoted to head coach in four weeks. <laughs> so maybe <laughs> not. Um, but I, I mean, I think that's going to be, I think, a real conversation and that's going to be a realistic conversation is they have to win one of those first three or he might get canned. Oh, see, I don't think so. Oh, I, I think they... I, I think that the Haslams are fighting their own history so hard that Hugh is almost guaranteed... This, I think he's guaranteed this entire season. Oh, I don't think so. I, I, I think... It, you know, it's kind of the Sashi thing for me, is the realities of the NFL are that the win-loss record matters. And bringing, bringing Hugh back after 0-16 was such a leap of faith... That if you can't win one of the first, let's call it four games, although I think just because they have the long week after the Thursday game, if they don't give they've got to win a game. If they don't give Hugh Jackson the entire season, I will criticize the Haslam's because well, you won't be alone. This is their fault. But they're getting criticized for bringing him back, anyways. But but they shouldn't be, not because Hugh earned his shot. But because this is what they built. I, this do, is the I don't garden, disagree with that. This is the garden they grew. I don't disagree with that. And that's, that's why. It's not about Hugh. It's about the Haslam's. Right. They're the ones who own the team. I'm holding my hand like a politician now. I don't know what I'm doing. But, um, no, that's, that's the way I feel about I, it. I, I agree with you in that you're looking at it more rationally than I am in the sense that I don't think it's fair to call Hugh Jackson a one in 31 head coach because no. even though that's what he is, because that first team, the one in fifteen team, that was built to go one in fifteen. It was actually built to go zero and sixteen. It was everybody was freaking out when they won a game and might have cost themselves the number one pick in the process. You really were. Um, but after after two seasons, none of that really matters. No. To to the public, to to fans, to all that. He was now viewed one in thirty one is Hugh Jackson. That that is he wears that. It's on him. 
after 0 and 16, and that you know, if if you start out 0 and 3, and then it's 1 and 34, right? One and yeah, I mean that's going to be tough. Right, but then, then I think you fire him. Right, I, I think he gets the full season. I don't. It would. De- mm. I oh, I see. So. I sorry, I messed up the yeah, math. Yeah, I give him the whole. I give him the whole season. I give him the whole season. I look to see that this team. First of all, I don't think they're going to go 0 and 4, or 0 and 3. But that's. If they do, that feels a lot different than if they don't. It depends don't. on what it looks like. It depends on what it's... Uh, I don't know. I don't. I think in the NFL, just the result matters at this point. I don't think yeah, it's... maybe. You know, last year, we could have done moral victories on, on a bunch of games, and they were still 0-16. Yeah. No, I... I but... And that's why I've, I've fought for him a little bit, you know, even though I didn't want to. I think... I mean, I think the point of adding Tyrod Taylor... Yes is to win a game in September. I think so, too. That's why you give up a third-round pick for him, because you, you, you know, we talked that's about... That's why they've been so steadfast about it. Right. That's why, because he gives you... He might... Baker Mayfield, for all I know, could give you a chance at a better, better record at the end of the year. Mm. I don't believe that, but you could talk me into a scenario where he grows and he's Rookie of the Year and all this stuff. Tyra Taylor gives you a better record of going 2-2 two and two in September. <laughs> yeah. And that's what matters most to this franchise, because that's the hole they put themselves in. Well, and that's why I, I love our, our friend Anthony Lima's <laughs> five wins with Baker Mayfield better than seven with Tyrod Taylor. I'm like, no, mm. it's not. Yeah. This organization needs to keep Kevin Love. Yes. <laughs> you know? Yeah. They needed Tyrod Taylor and they, they don't, they, they can't be in tank mode anymore. That's why, that's why they not only draft Chubb, they right. signed Carlos High, they bring back Duke Johnson, they, they, the Jarvis Landry thing, I mean, they've gone all out to try and win more than five and a half. Well, games. and thank God they did, because you said you said you were excited now about this team for yes. the for the first time in three years. I always get that little twinge of like sure. preseason excitement. The NFL's coming, Madden's coming out, you get your first look at these players, you get a look at the schedule, all that stuff. I mean, last year I was up here in Cleveland for the first time, so it was a little different. And there was some excitement with Deshaun Kaiser, at least in the preseason, but that none of this what what we're feeling right now would be feasible if they didn't go all out this off season yeah. because of the hole they put themselves in. So when LeBron and gets, that's the that's why Sashi's plan was yeah. never feasible because you can't take three two years of losing and carry it into a third year. No. You need this refresh restart, which undoes some of the hey we're developing these young guys because right. you have to bring in people over top of them. When LeBron James was drafted. I remember sitting there wondering to myself when the last time it was that I saw a Cavaliers player dunk the basketball. <laughs> I through the Fratello years and and into the pre-LeBron years, I couldn't remember the Cavaliers getting a dunk. And I'm sure I'm making it up. Oh, the, sure the year before they had they had Darius Miles and and Ricky Davis. I understand. <laughs> so I can't remember the Browns scoring a touchdown last year. Um, there were so few yeah. of them that I'm, I'm sure I could if I really, really tried. Right. I get it's, what you're saying. So it's like damn hard. And the Browns are going to score touchdowns this year. Right. Maybe three or more in a game. No, don't get crazy. I Let's, know. Okay. Now you're off the If wheels. they get a defensive. Calm down. If they get a defensive <laughs> touchdown, it could be four or five. I, yeah, like I, I know Josh Gordon scored a touchdown, but I don't know which <laughs> game it was in. Yeah. Okay. So that, yeah, I was at that Pittsburgh game and somebody put on sunglasses and I just can't remember if it was him or Corey. Probably wasn't Corey Coleman. And Joku wore the sunglasses once too. Yeah. No, well, did he? I think so. Cause he did the, the jumping spike yeah. in the ball through his legs thing when they were down by like 20 some <laughs> points. I like how probably. he's made that his signature. T- like you need. You should you shouldn't have a signature touchdown celebration until your tenth touchdown. You can't create a signature touchdown. Hey, everybody! Celebration. The, the, the old millennials are making fun of the younger oh millennials. <laughs> oh my god! Well, this will transition us into yes. our. Uh, I want to talk to you about being off Twitter because cool. I'm, I'm I'm a little bit jealous because I'm not able to to be off Twitter and no. I would love to take. Uh, just like a month break. Is that what you're doing is a month yeah. break? Yeah. So we took off after July 4th. So basically July 5th to the end of the month. Um, a couple of guys from Waiting for Next Year, a couple of us who are addicted to that that swipe down refresh. Oh, yeah. um, my thumb physically hurts at times from that's it. That's funny. It's not, but it's sad. <laughs> my thumb used to hurt as a kid on in, certain times yeah. on Nintendo, certain games. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I just, I needed a break. 
I was I was too caught up. I was too busy. I wasn't using it the right way anymore. Yeah. I was getting into long, drawn-out conversations with no clear point. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm not saying that I'm the guy who needs to just broadcast at people and then walk away. Yeah, It's good for engagement, but I need to tighten those windows. I need to get it off my phone for a while. Yeah. And it's been really, it's been really nice. I miss it a little bit. I miss uh, sending. So what do you miss? I miss sending tweets to Ken and, and Anthony Lima yeah. in the morning. Um, and then there are certain things like uh, highlights live on Twitter, mm-hmm. and they're not living on the web the same way anymore. See that? Yeah, I, I would wonder about that. Just to, or, or even news. Yes. Like I, I literally see news in real time. I have the the scroll down on my computer screen. Well, and if you try and if you tried to get information so, about let, the Kawhi Leonard trade, and click on hyperlinks in Google, websites are designed so poorly today that mm-hmm. you almost can't get it. The only times I've cheated is where, like, I'll go look at a Woj tweet to get some details, and then I log back off. Yeah. So I'm not I'm not interacting. Right. And I'm not refreshing and scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. How did so? How did you learn? Of so, I was sitting at my work desk yesterday, mm-hmm. and I just saw a tweet from Ken Rosenthal pop up on my stream that said the Indians have acquired Brad Hand. Like, how did you learn about the Brad Hand trade? So it's a little bit cheating for me because waiting for next year has a Slack. Okay, so but that's not cheating. I learned on Slack. Well, no, I mean like. If you are Joe Fan, yeah. without a sports website, and you quit Twitter, mm-hmm. you are going to miss stuff, you are, or you're going to be the last one to know. Yeah, but you know I've what? Got, I've got another channel where I learn things. There are so many sites, though, in like especially Bleacher Report, just because they're who I use, that do push alerts. That's I mean, true. Bleacher reports come in real time. I've like turned the, off all push alerts. Oh, that's how come. Because I want to check my phone. I don't want my phone to check me. Okay. <laughs> the, only, the only push alerts I have are for text messages. Okay. So that's, I mean, I, I think that's a valuable tool, though, if you were, yes. you know, to, to get off of Twitter. It is, I still have friends who have the ESPN. Do, 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 yeah. It's just, it is funny, like. Why are you jealous? Well, just because I, I, one, I would like the challenge. Like, I like to challenge myself, like, yeah. in that capacity. And like a crash diet. Like in January, in January, I didn't drink all of January. I didn't have any reason not to drink. I, I could have been enjoying the NFL playoff games and been fine. I, I, I didn't go through anything. I, I could have tried. I just wanted to see if I could go 30 days without drinking. I like like 30 day challenges. I hate dieting though. So no, I don't, I have no desire to diet. Um, Wait but, till that ma- metabolism stops. You know, I'm getting there. <laughs> trust me. Um, but yeah, it's, and it's also, you do, one thing I did actually, because I, I got to a point probably about a year ago where I wasn't enjoying Twitter either. And it was just like every day was a fight with somebody or especially during Brown season, people get so nasty. I get nasty. I, I go back and read my tweet. That's the one thing I did though, is I went back and like, if you go back and just read like a month of your tweets, you'll realize sometimes just how your tone looking back could be perceived a way that you didn't intend it in the moment. Once you're removed from Yes, it. once you're removed from yeah. that emotion and and you feel silly and you feel embarrassed. And also you'll realize how many things you tweet about that you don't need to tweet about. And, and I'm guilty of this too. Like the Thunder traded Carmelo yesterday to the Hawks. And I had to I had to retweet it and say, I think this is a good trade and give my take why. Who nobody cares what I think about Carmelo. I I'm not some NBA insider. I'm not Mark Stein. I'm not I'm not Brian Windhorse. Why nobody cares what I think. It's just it's this thing where you, and this is another thing. This is and people make fun of me because they call me the Twitter police. I love when there's like a Woj bomb and something happens and everybody retweets it just with woe. Or, yeah. Oh, uh, exclamation point, exclamation point. Like, what, the, what are you contributing here? And the only reason, and, and I used to be guilty of that too. You feel this need to be included in it, even though it's there. Everybody knows it. And so I'll always tweet like, Hey, did you guys see what the Thunder did? Like 30 minutes after the trade? Like, like, Hey, hey, nobody let me know about this yet. It's, it's funny because what they've, what, what has happened with Twitter is it's become a permanent archive and it should be Snapchat. Mm-hmm. Every tweet should expire yeah. after 30 or 45 days uh-huh. or something because you lose all that context. There's no point in it being out there or you were 17. Yeah. I mean, do you want to talk about this this kid hater from the All-Star game 
Right. Who, who, uh, That's my... Some tweets from when he was 17. And look, there's no... You can't just say he was young. Yeah. Well, yeah. But at the same time... we It's not just him, though. We do it to every every athlete in the draft now. Have every, you ever considered deleting your archives? Um, I've gone through and manually deleted years' worth of tweets from when I was in college and stuff just for that very... And I found ones that probably could have cost me jobs down the line. <laughs> like, it's, I probably shouldn't even put that out there. But, like, I mean, and, and they weren't, like, racist or anything, but they were, you know, if you're an upset Cavs fan and LeBron leaves your team and you're tweeting dumb stuff, then there's stuff that could have gotten retweeted a month ago that yeah. would have looked bad for me. Check out this salt from 2010. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, I mean, we do it to everybody and, and it's, it's silly. And but, we use Twitter to define everybody by their worst moments. Right. And why would you, why would you ever want to leave that out there? And it's, you know, why exclamation points with a Woj bomb are important? Because it brings you into the conversation in the moment because it's a chat room. Yeah. And we shouldn't have permanent archives of anything on Twitter. Yeah. I'm, I'm with Mark Cuban on this where everything should have an expiration date. Well, the other thing too is I, I think context gets lost all on Twitter it. all the time. And especially, um, for me, I mean, I, I have the, I have the special blue check mark and I have a, a decent sized following. And so I'll give you an example. Um, I was covering a Cavs Pacers game in Indiana during the playoffs. And some fan I saw in the street was wearing this, this disgusting, this racist LeBron James shirt. Whoa. And yeah, it had, it had basically a racist caricature of LeBron James and said oh. F LeBron. And so I took a picture of it and said, greetings from Indiana. And so the intent of my tweet was. Did you keep the dude's face out? Yeah. Okay. And so, and, and people were giving me crap for keeping his face out because they were, well, so this is, but that's the problem. The problem is that I kept the dude's face out because I said greetings from Indiana, knowing that my followers knew that I was in Indiana covering the game as a professional. What I didn't know was when Domani Jones retweeted it, all oh. of his followers were thought would think I was the fan in the shirt. Yeah. <laughs> and so that but that's on them. But the, it's also on me for not providing enough context. That's true. As, in in my role, and but so I, that was a I've learning also, experience. I've also Bomani's taken a step back. Yeah, he he recently said on one of his podcasts that he took a step back from Twitter on purpose because he wasn't enjoying it. He wasn't getting what he wanted from it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just it's interesting that I not only felt the need to take a sabbatical, but there are all these different people who are who are feeling the same way. Yeah. Um, and I, I think there are safe ways to use it. I don't think it's like cigarettes. No, where it's not. Yeah. There's always going to be bad for your health. But I do think it's kind of like cigarettes in a way. Well, I think it's the idea that it's rotting our brains. There's something to that. But yes. there's also, I think, something to the fact that it's a part of society. And yeah. I, But I've also seen it, just, and it affects different people in different ways, but I've mm -hmm. seen it destroy some people's productivity. Yeah. You are a professional who writes articles every single day, and that's your job, mm -hmm. and Twitter's not going to keep you from doing your job. Yeah. But so many, I think it's destroyed blogs. I think it yeah. destroyed, you know, tumblers. A, yeah. a lot of a lot of places where people were making good content um, and really making a mark. Now they now they they fart out a couple tweets, right? And it's scratching an itch, even though it's not creating anything of value. Yeah. Well, that's. I mean, that's. It's, Twitter's been around more than ten years now, and that's Crazy. people are still trying to figure out the best way to use it to monetize what they do. And it's interesting. I mean, the, a lot of stand-up comedians stopped using it because they were just giving up their best yeah. jokes for free. Yeah, I know. That I, I wonder about that all the time. I'm like, if I didn't tweet all these jokes and if I just wrote them down, like, could I just have like a stand-up comedy career? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> probably not, because I don't think I have the presence for it. But maybe I don't a know. little bit of practice. Yeah, I, I watch. Uh, what's the show on Crashing? I watch Crashing. Yeah. I, could, I could be that guy. No, yeah. I couldn't. Um, Anything else before we get out of here? I know we've no, run a man, little that's, long. That's it. You watching Get Up or not Get Up? Uh, High Noon? You're a big Bomani fan. Yeah, no, I'm not. Do they have a podcast yet? I might listen to a podcast. Yeah, that's I'm all. It, I, it, I'm having trouble keeping up with all my podcasts. I don't watch TV. Yeah. I don't either. I don't. I used to. I used to watch uh, P PTI and all that. And now I just listen to the Labitard podcast and 
some wrestling podcasts, and yeah, with, if I have time, Adam Carolla. <laughs> with, uh, with audio, I can do other things. Yeah. So that's what I do. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for stopping by. So I'll talk to you in a couple of Yeah. Months. We'll, uh, <laughs> no, we'll, we'll try to get a couple more of these out there uh, throughout the Browns preseason. But uh, that's going to do it for today's three sports podcast. For Craig Lindell, I'm Ben Axelrod. If you enjoyed the show, subscribe on iTunes, leave a rating, leave a review, tell a friend. Uh, thanks for listening.